shorten the flow fit to athletic ground engagement. Series three will be restricted to certified coaches only. So once you develop the skills in this program, it's time for you to move on and register for a seminar. In series two, flow fit two, your goal is to take these six unique proprietary exercises and target them to transform your falling into controlled ascent and descent. The value of this virtue cannot be underestimated because the ability to navigate from horizontal to vertical and back and forth is a central feature of athletic flow. Now, FlowFit2 still observes CST's intuitive training protocol. So you've been practicing this on FlowFit1, but it deserves repeat because now we're moving into higher levels of athleticism with FlowFit2. You're going to take each one of these six exercises and practice them until your technique level is eight or higher on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the best form that you could possibly perform. Once your technique level is at an eight or higher, you're going to be focusing upon your discomfort level. Your discomfort level needs to be at a three or lower. So when you're moving through and practicing each one of the exercises, you need to continue to release and find the most gradual way to allow that discomfort level to drop. So you're practicing to keep your technique level high and your discomfort level low. Once it's a technique level of eight or higher, a discomfort level of three or lower, only then can you turn on the juice. That's your perceived effort. So your exertion can become a six once your effort level is eight or higher, your discomfort level is three or lower. Then you turn on the juice, not before. If your discomfort level is still very high and you start to perform with high degrees of exertion, high degrees of athleticism, if you have any type of precondition or if you have any type of impediment or compression in your joint, it's only going to be reinforced. So pushing through pain is not a wise idea. In the same way, with your technique level, if your technique level is like a four or five and you decide to turn on the juice because you just want to work harder, all that will happen is that you'll be reinforcing poor form throughout the movement. You're not training the exercise. You're training the technique that you're creating through that low level of form. Focus on keeping your technique level above an eight, your discomfort level beneath the three, then turn on the juice and hit your exertion level. Each of the six exercises combined in a chain. Once you've practiced all six exercises, you tie them together into one long flow. To perform them will require about a minute. A minute's a long time to continue to move. It doesn't sound like a lot, but we're not out trotting for a couple hours. You're performing each of the movements which take you through a unique mechanical operation called the six degrees of freedom. Every function that the body can do will be manipulated. That's the specific design of this program. So once you compress that into one long chain, some unique things happen to your body. Even though one repetition is only one minute, if you're performing it for the target of about 14 to 18 minutes, something biochemically unique happens in your body. Now, there's a signpost for it, distress. As you start to become uncomfortable, little thoughts will bubble to your head. These thoughts are tied to emotions. So you'll want to quit, you'll want to stop. I'm not talking about pain. I'm not talking about something in, in your knee or your hip that you really need to stop. Although phantom pains will come about. It's not the same type and you'll be able to differentiate. Just can trust in yourself, trust in your intuition. What I'm talking about is that, that circular respiratory distress. You start breathing heavy. You can't keep continue because you just feel like your lungs are going to explode and your blood pressure, you just can't control it. Keep working on your breath. Keep continuing. As long as you know that this isn't, that this isn't a health issue, this is you wanting to stop the effort level, just to turn it down a little. You need to step one step farther through that membrane. And circular respiratory distress is very much like a wall. It's, it's viscous and if you push through it, you can feel resistance. Some sports psychologists call it a runner's high. When runners continue through a point of no return, they just suddenly are no longer in distress. Now, what happens to us at that point is a biochemical adaptation in our brain 
to accommodate the distress because if you continue, your brain will find a more efficient way to carry on the activity. We discuss this as the neuroimmunoendocrine endocrine response because the transformation is total body. It's through all of the super systems of your body, not just, not just your glands, not just your neurology, not just your nerves, but also your immune system. So every time you push through that adaptation phase, something unique happens in the body. If you spend 14 to 18 minutes a day, three or four times a week on this particular program, you'll find that the results that you achieve are much greater than if you were to perform several hours of lower intensity training at the gym or out on the field. The goal is to step through that adaptation, to go through all six degrees while maintaining your technique level of eight or higher, discomfort level of three or lower. Then you turn on the juice. If you can achieve this, what you'll be stepping into is this paramount feature of circular strength training, which we call athletic flow. Take the opportunity to challenge that little drunken monkey brain that starts to throw up all of the rationale of why you should stop. It's only 14, 15 minutes. You can do anything for that short amount of time. So practice the techniques, chain them together, then turn on the juice as long as you're using that governor of technique level of eight or higher, discomfort level of three or lower. Can't repeat that enough. And you will gain entrance through Flow Fit 2 to Athletic Flow. You may have seen basic versions of frontal ground engagement in traditional calisthenics. However, we need to take this into higher degrees of athleticism and coordination. So I'm gonna be showing you variations that you probably haven't seen before and some that you have not seen before. The basic frontal ground engagement is to take this diamond of keeping your elbows close to your ribs and place it approximately between your feet. At the same time, both legs come backwards. That's going to be problematic until you develop the local muscular strength to, to handle that absorption. So the first thing that's going to be necessary is to graduate slowly down to the ground. Even if you move slowly, you need to focus upon your exhalation. So as you're compressing your body down, working on your flat foot squat, you're exhaling into this compression and you're going to have a second exhalation as you place your chest down over top of your elbows. So notice that your elbows stay tight because this is the closed and protected position for your shoulders. Elbows stay tight, flat foot squat, hands come down. At the same time that the legs kick out, you're gonna work on exhale and absorbing the shock into the mat. Now, that's the basic version and you're handling it slowly. Notice the hips are up because your hips are going to be absorbing some residual shock from engaging the ground. You don't want to absorb shock by applying force to the mat. You want to absorb shock through the elasticity that you're storing in your body. So we're repeated again. The basic version of the frontal ground engagement, arms come in, squat down, legs go out, exhale again. Now I'm going to focus on keeping the head to the side. It's going to be an important feature because until you learn to absorb, absorb shock efficiently, you don't want to absorb it with your face. Something I learned very quickly in martial arts. Arms in, squat down, head to the side, exhale. Absorb shock with your hips. You can ride out the residual wave of impact through the rest of your body between these three points. The point between your hands and the point between your feet. Fluidly, when you end up on the ground, we're going to externally rotate our legs and do the te a technique that I call the frog swim in order to engage standing once again. So you come down, your legs externally rotate, heels come down basically. So in this position, you're going to be re-engaging your knees to your elbows. It's probably going to require another exhale and you're loading your lower back. So if you imagine this up dog. Right now, you can't release this stored elasticity because it's like stretching a rubber band over top of a pencil. As you pull it, you can fire the pencil away. 
But since the ground is stopping us from moving, that stored elasticity is caught. As you externally rotate the legs, it's now free. So you, when you load the lower back, the legs come up. To keep your hands in play, your hands are going to come back almost as if you're doing a football block. Press with your hips up to begin the next repetition. So the frog, squ the frog swim is the key feature in taking the elasticity that you load from that shock absorption and bringing you back up. So all together. And notice, even though I'm turning my head to the side and absorbing shock with my, my, the rest of my body, my head still makes impact with the, the mat. So you really need to focus on turning your head to the side. The next variation on the front ground engagement is to move a little bit forward. So instead of coming down and back, you're going to take this leaping outwards. As you do this, you want to make this incremental. So if you were starting here, it's best to just lean forward as if you were going to work into a yoga crow. As you lean forward, notice how the knees are externally rotated. That'll allow you to exhale. Move out, frog swim back, replace your hands, step back, and begin again, out. And keep graduating your hands farther and farther away until you're each time extending how far you can move. One little feature, if you can get a close look at this. Your hands aren't palm striking onto the, to the ground, especially when you're not using a mat. Your hands are moving like a tree frog. Fingers spread out and splay. This is like a little mini brachiation where you're slowing it down through it, expanding your finger pads. The last thing to make contact is your palm heel. It's difficult to see it when you're doing it full motion. Put your fingers spread out for the next repetition. The final variation is a little challenging, a little more challenging than the prior. So you need to focus on trying to make it incremental, though that's going to be difficult. It really is. This is going to take a step up. So I would suggest getting a lot of juice, a lot of reap a lot of benefits out of this, the prior variation before you start working from standing to a quad squat. Because now you're absorbing, not with your hips, but with your entire body. And you're not going to be able to place that chest on the ground. You're going to have to absorb it in the strength of your arms and legs. When you're moving, I'll just show you first. The load is so much greater that it's like a quick stretch on a rubber band and a release. So I don't suggest, and I highly discourage you from trying to do this right off the bat. Even if you've been doing flow fit one, you need to work through the increments of these variations. When you move into the quad squat, your hands are still coming to diamond. You're still exhaling, but your knees are coming out and your elbows are coming out. Your back is parallel to the ground and you're absorbing here. Parallel, not like a bucking bronco or you'll pull a lawn dart into the mat with your face. You need to absorb with the legs as much using that frog swim technique that you were doing your get up on. The legs externally rotate so that you can absorb storing elasticity in your hip, hip flexors and absorb through the posterior chain. Coming back up is a very short whip. So you've Stretch the rubber band, loaded it. When you let it release, you're letting this bounce back up to flat foot. So you're pushing. It looks like you're pushing up, but you're not. You're pushing back in your palm heels as you bring your knees underneath. This is going to require a second exhale so that you can come back into this initial position. It looks effortless because when you practice it, it is. But initially, it's going to be very clunky. So I suggest that you practice. Don't try and train the technique.
It's a very compressed version of the long frontal ground engagement. Your job is to select the, the skill level that you want to work. Because you may send yourself, you may send your effort level so high that you'll be sacrificing technique on the other exercises when you put them together in a chain. Your total goal is to keep your technique level above an eight. So you need to choke down the variation. You may be working on for the first several repetitions in your flow. But by the end, you might And that's totally acceptable because your job, once again, your job is to complete all six degrees of freedom. Take each one of these three variations on the frontal ground engagement and plug them in once you've practiced them. The lateral ground engagement pillow version is much like the frontal ground engagement, but the body's twisting. And it's this twisting that's taking the rubber band and this bandolier of myofascia across your body and adding more stored elasticity by its compression. So as this torsion happens and the twisting to engage the ground, you're creating an enormous amount of potential energy. It's also a great degree of athletic challenge because of the way the body is being contorted. Just like all of the exercises, you need to make this incremental. So the basic version of the lateral ground engagement is to twist the body and squat over top of one leg. You notice that your heel needs to become free in order to protect your knee. You come down, engage the ground. Hands are forming the diamond just like in the frontal ground engagement. But this front leg is actually what's shooting free. In a moment, your back leg is going to become the post, the supporting leg. So you've engaged the ground, the back leg frees, and this becomes a pillow. Your head's turning to the side so that you don't block with your face. As your head turns to the side, you're loading this twist on the body, and you're going to release it from your leg. In the basic version, you're going to be doing more of a press to bring your foot back and uncoil to come to a standing. Your exhalation comes as you compress to one-legged squat. As you pillow out and free the leg, you have an ancillary, another exhalation right here. And you have a third exhalation as you come through the effort phase of the motion to replace your foot back to flat foot. Uncoil and standing. I know that sounds like a lot of exhales, but you'll do it in three series, in the depths of your exhalation. Leading from your tailbone to your crown, maintain your structure. Then, as you lean belly to the thigh, come downwards, engage the ground, back up in the basic version, uncoil. Still lifting from the crown now, instead of the tailbone, descend, lift back up. When you move along, you'll notice that this actually requires a lot less effort than the compressed version. The second version of this movement, instead of moving down and long, is to keep this tight, and it's much like the, the quad squat version of the front ground engagement. You're twisting and loading rather rapidly. The quad squat twisted, where you're almost doing a base change, like we do in basic body flow. But you're keeping this rooted. It's going to be a high degree of athletic challenge, so focus upon exhaling through the effort, especially as it starts to juice up. When you move the leg, instead of extending out, stays rather close to move back, twist, there's going to be a high degree of localized muscular strength that you'll need to develop in the basic version, 
of working. Make sure that you're focusing sufficient time on the basics and don't try and jump don't try and jump up to a more advanced version of the same variation. Reason is, your athleticism comes from chaining all six exercises together, not focusing on the most difficult one. If you put your effort level too high on one exercise, by the time you get to the next exercise, you may not be able to continue. Don't blow it on one exercise. Strain out through the entire chain. So work on the basic version, extend the leg, slowly replace the foot before you start on that twisting quad hop load. The leg swoop version of a lateral ground engagement is taking these two points, your hand and your foot, and separating them in such a way that you're spreading out the distribution of force. So if I were to place my hand and foot down as I move my foot up, move my hand up, move my foot up, move my hand up. You're going to be doing a one-legged squat, but it's going to be assisted because you're moving the leg and foot away from each other. Bringing your body down closer to your planted leg you're going to have to work on that exhalation. Try and lead from the crown, lead from the coccyx, lift, lift from the crown to engage the ground with hand and foot. Now, that's a real basic version. So basically, you're facing one direction, you bring your foot to the opposite side, and you sit down like you were doing a one-legged squat, one-legged deck squat. The real basic version. So in the exercise, Practice that until you can coordinate hand and foot. Once you, you've had the hand and foot coordinated, you want to separate them simultaneously. So you're not sitting down before separating. It's certainly not trying to brace and stop, nor the idiocy of hitting the ground. This is a temporary fix you have limited number of repetitions per lifetime, or at least per arm. Smoothly engaging the ground allows you to exhale through the distribution and begin the back portion of this exercise. The back portion is like a spinal rock hurdler stretch. So you have your legs split and you're moving your leg over your head In the next step, what I want you to focus on is taking your left ear to your shoulder or whatever direction, the opposite ear from the leg that's going over. So if you were to swing your leg down, you exhale through it. This is already stored elastic energy. So you're keeping that swing continuing up your shoulder. Now, this is like a half plow. I'm pausing here for a second because I want you to notice that I'm not rolling over my neck, which could be very painful. You're moving your head out of the way. As you slide your head out of the way, it frees, and you have one knee down. The leg that was compressed gets pressed up to flat foot so that you can begin again. So let's go through each one of the components. You need to the ground, store the elasticity, half plow, knee down, flat foot. You'll notice this from basic body flow that you're right now in a shin squat. Exhale. Once you get comfortable with it, you're going to be doing a long arm roll. Instead of this being so compressed. Keep focused on this when you watch this repetition. Keep focused on the screw of the arm. What that's going to do is deselect these large chains of myofascia so that you can move smoothly 
over into that chin squat again. When you move, imagine keeping these together to move into the next repetition. And you'll notice you'll have to take a step each time that you're moving through to recover your ground. Marry that hand to the next leg so that you can move on to the next repetition. In the arm screw variant of the rear ground engagement, you're working on twisting. Now notice that you'll move to the shin squat to a shim box. So your first graduation in this exercise is being able to descend with control through these two exercises. If you can't do this, don't move on. Focus on coming back into shin squat, even if you're using this training wheel over here, pushing into a flat foot squat as you're ascending back to standing. Exhale down through the compression, hips twist, shin box, Inhale as you lift from the crown. As you get proficient with the basic, you should be able to remove the training wheel. That'll be your, your guide to know when you can move on to the next level. If you can do this without a training wheel, then you know that it's time to move on to the next variation, the next skill level development, the complexity of the skill. So as you engage, now you're going to move by the shin box without actually going through it. So as you move, exhaling down, this slides out as you roll to your shoulders. So you pass through the shin box without actually doing it. Now the component that is really critical here is rolling the shoulders instead of clunking here. As the hand slides out, this shoulder comes up and rolls over. When you become proficient with it, it should be in such a way that you're elevating your hips into a shoulder bridge in order to continue. Because from here, we're gonna, we're gonna move on to the next component of the skill. So if we move shoulder roll, the basic version, staying in base on, your on the ground, moving through. In the final component, when you keep that bridge, you're in a leg thread. So as you move out, your hips are up. Leg thread means if this were the eye of a needle, this hole created from your flex knee, you're going to pass this leg all the way through until you expose your hip to the ground. Once your hip is exposed to the ground, then you can move Back to the frog swim version of the front ground engagement to re-engage standing. So let's go over that again. You engage in slot, bridge up, thread the leg through until your hips are exposed. Remove your arms out of the, the way, frog swim up to standing. Practice each one of those components, and it'll be staccato at first where you're trying to focus on one performance goal at a time. Technique level eight or higher, discomfort level three or lower. Once you have that, then it is sufficient time for you to do the final version. Like every one of the prior versions, it develops, it requires a certain development of mu localized muscular strength. So I'm gonna show it from here. Imagine that as this elbow bends, you're also rotating it. So this rotation with the flexion allows you to bring your elbow close to your ribs. We're gonna continue the shoulder roll up into the bridge. So it may look like this catches, but instead of trying to slide this, even if you have a tacky surface, the prior skill, if it's stopped, there's nothing else that you can do because your hand's held. But if you remove that impact, by compressing the next adjacent joint, you can protect your body and absorb force with the entire rest of your body. 
It also will require a high degree of athleticism because you're focusing all of your body weight on one arm. You're basically doing a reverse one arm push up, the eccentric version, the breaking version. So as you come back, now it looks effortless, but that's because of practicing the prior components. When you move, see how you pass through that shin box, move over, thread the leg. Arms are already in, so you don't need to move them out of the way. Laterally, externally rotate the legs, hit the flat foot squat, and come back to standing. Now I'm already in position for my next repetition. So if I use this arm, I'm moving that direction. So obviously I need to alternate, switch to the other hand. Keep your balance between the two. But if you're working on this arm screw right away, you're, you may even cause an injury because you need to develop the steps. You need to build it, the, the house from the basement first. And that is, use your training wheel. Come up. Once you have this without the training wheel, then use the slide, the shoulder roll. Once you have the shoulder roll down, add on the bridge so that this elasticity continues to load the lower back up into the frog swing to stand. And then finally, you'll have the localized muscular strength to handle the arm screw to absorb with minimal discomfort. As you take the components from your prior skill, when you're working in the rear ground engagement of developing that shin box into your shin squat into a shin box, we're now going to take that shin box and how you engage the ground and move it laterally. This requires a component of extension where you're laterally flexing and moving the body over to the one direction or the other, laterally. The basic component is just like we built in the prior exercise. You're working into a shin squat first, into a shin box. If you don't have these two components built comfortably, where your sit bones can rest, it's not advisable to move on to the subsequent portions of that, the movement. Because if this is loaded here and you can't go down any farther, and you try and leap from here, that's where you can have a potential stretch reflex. You need to build this from the basement up. So first, shin, shin squat, shin box. Once you have the shin box built, that's when this arm begins to extend. And notice, just like we did in the rear ground engagement with the arm screw, this forearm is going to marry into your thigh. In the basic version, you're going to free your legs and walk your hands out to place your head away from the storage of the balance, which is on your shoulder. So it would be like moving from your hands and shins to moving your head out of the way. And notice I'm not loading my neck. I'm not putting this on my head. All the weight is resting on the soft tissue of my upper back, which is why you need to work on that arm screw from a couple exercises prior. When you walk your legs out in front, you're letting your head move without impact. There's no pressure on, the, on your head or neck. It's all along the plane of your shoulders and upper back. To release it, you're dropping your hips, heads moving to the opposite side, and peeling out of the way. Notice how the arm stays out of the way. So let's go over all the components in the basic version. I say basic and that might make you chuckle, but this is FlowFit 2. So at this point, you have already been developing the movement components here. You need to practice these. It's not like you can take the complete exercises and jump right into it and turn on the juice. Work the base, practice these exercises until you can get the technique above the knee. Knee drops down in their shin squat, create your shin box. As you marry this arm in close to your thigh, screwing it in tight, Reach up over top, free your legs, 
roll across your shoulder plane, not your neck. Let your hips drop, your head peels out, and you can move back into the next shin box. To move into the shin box, the shin squat from the shin box, take this foot and place it right next to your knee. So notice how along this cylinder, you're going to stay on your laces. If you move to here, this is where most people injure themselves. Because of this flexion and rotating it, you can damage the knee. But there's a closed back position where you protect the knee by keeping the toes extended, keeping the foot flat so it's even with the shin, and rolling across your shin. That protects the knee on movement. And rather than being contraindicated here, where you could damage yourself, by curling the foot underneath, you can move right back from the shin squat into flat foot squat. So this is a key component of your ascent out of the shin box lateral work. Develop this component. If you can't do this component, then find a different way to stand up. Once you've developed this component, then you can move through the entire exercise of this variation. Peeling the head out of the way. And back up to standing. Now, once you have all of those developed, you are going to, just like we worked on the first two exercises, load elastic, this elastic bandolier of myofascia across your frontal plane by this flexion coming forward as you bend over yourself. By keeping that tight, you should be able to allow the elasticity to erupt. It should sling out like you're letting go of a rubber band. I'm gonna try and do it slowly. As you come in, this is already staying compressed because you've loaded it through this twisting and through this extension. So the rubber band stretches. As it does, you're going to free the legs. This will come all the way over into your next shin box. And as you're keeping this compressed, that's what's helping you reascend. You're passing through without ever touching that shin box. Let's do it again. I'll try and do it fluidly but slow. Knee compresses, freeze into the next release of the shin box. And then obviously you can go right back the next direction. But if you try and jump into that, more than likely you'll injure yourself. You have to build the components first. Don't ever underestimate the minutia of just one component. Don't ever underestimate the the efficacy of your breath being integrated with your structure, with you being able to move. So if you hold your breath here, it'll fire out some way. You're going to either burst a vessel, or the move won't be able to complete. This is like a big balloon that's inhibiting your movement. So exhaling through it is the only way to achieve that lateral roll. If this is a new movement for you, if you haven't been practicing Flow Fit One, crank it down and go back to Flow Fit One because you need to be able to feel where you're moving across the shoulder plane, and not compressing on the neck. Initially, a lot of people, when they jump too high in increment and complexity, they'll roll across their face. <laughs> and loading all of that on these very small vertebrae with these very tender muscles can cause dangerous things. Focus on building the increments, exhaling, and relaxing through the movement. If you can't get your technique level above an eight, your discomfort level above a three, do not dare turn on the juice above a six. It should stay underneath, underneath an effort level of six until you can consistently perform at an eight or higher and a three or lower in discomfort. One-legged hurdler spinal rack requires that you work through each increment just like every one of the prior exercises. 
When you're first developing your one-legged squat, it's important to use your training wheels so that you're sitting down. You could even use blocks, large wooden boxes, sturdy chairs, until you can control your descent and sit down on your sits bones. Once you no longer require these training wheels, then you know it's time. Because you don't want to begin the spinal rock aspect of this until you're not clunking onto your tailbone. That's a really important consideration when you don't have a nice squishy mat. When you're hitting concrete, marble, or any type of macadam, if your tailbone is, is exposed, it's going to be injured. So the component to know is once you've developed this squat to where your sit bones pass to your lower back, this is flat. Once your lower back is flat, then you know that you can begin the next portion of the movement. You had an exhalation on your one-legged squat. There's a second exhalation, a complementary exhalation as you bring your knee to your chest to begin the back roll. Now I suggest that you use all of your prior skills of knowing that your ear stays to your opposite shoulder. So in the spinal rock version, you're exhaling and extending this leg. To extend the leg, if you try and kick up this high, you may be able to do it, but the sudden extension of this myofascia could cause a stretch reflex if you have any type of inflexibility. Range of motion is prior to flexibility. First, bring the knee to the chest. In order to bring your knee to your chest, you have to exhale. So if you want to put your, head, your, your foot over your head, you need to exhale. Knee to chest and extend. That's the first half of this motion. So you exhale through it, knee to chest, the foot extends. The second is a counter twist, like taking a washcloth and wringing, wringing out the, the fluid. You're taking this knee along the vector of your lower leg and projecting it the opposite direction to get that full twist on the pelvis. It doesn't have to be a split. You're just focusing on that twist. That will be enough of a load to lead you into the next portion. So let's go back up standing. You've worked on your one-legged descent. When you come back, initially you're going to need the training wheels. Don't think that <laughs> wobbling so furiously is going to be a better repetition than controlling it with your training wheels. Use your training wheels. So if you're here, place your weight properly over your planted leg so that your knee's not extending over top of your foot. Then once it is, then you can start to push your hips up towards the ceiling at a 45 degree angle. You're lifting from your crown, pulling your coccyx. Exhale through the effort to come to a standing position. And again, you can build this with blocks. You can build it with sturdy chairs, not flimsy chairs. You don't want them jumping all over the place. So that you're moving down between two chairs and pressing back up. And once you have that developed, then you can start to do it without any help. My suggestion is use a visualization. Reach out as if you were going to grab onto two cinder blocks or to a pole or you're holding onto a rubber strand. So when you do the hurdler and come back, reach as if you're holding onto those to get you back to standing because it will activate the posterior chain to get you back to a standing position from that elasticity you've stored. Reach out, back to standing. Now, that's the intermediary version. When you move on to the advanced version, you're closing the chain. And what closing the chain means is that there's not so much predictable movement. An open chain means that a lot of things can happen. You can put these down. You can push off of them. They're all over, all over the place. Very unpredictable. When you close the chain and grab your foot, there's a lot less that can happen, so it forces it to be proper structure, proper activation of selective tension. You're moving down, tucking underneath, and extending. As you extend, you're maintaining control of your foot. Here's the, the challenge, coming back. Coming back with your knee locked, you're going to need to exhale and extend with your heel to come up onto your flat foot. As you 
use this rocking motion to extend, you're still holding on to that imaginary rope, towel, rubber band, whatever you're using. But because of this closed chain, there's not much deviation. You can't use torque to jump up. It's very challenging and you may want to, it looks sexy like you want to, oh, this is cool, I want to do this movement. But if you focus on jumping right into this movement, you might play, place too much strain on this posted knee. So my suggestion is focus on the basic components, build it from the basement upwards. And then when you get to the closed chain, one-legged hurdler spinal rock, you'll be at the peak of your athleticism. Thank you.